So you've got your group of people. Say the three of you are on a board together. You two are working for the organization. You guys are stakeholders in the organization. So say maybe you're members that are served by this community. And you are a, um, uh, uh, maybe written your risk management or looking at it from a law perspective. And so you guys collectively are an organizing body for an event. This is a lot of people to have as an organizing body for an event. So you probably won't be the people who will actually implement the event. But what it is is when you start out conceptualizing an event and what you want to do, having a large organizing body that looks at the event from multiple different angles is very important. So what you first want to do is see if your event is feasible. You don't start with an event plan. You don't start with the date of your event. You, don't, you start with why you're having an event. So if you take a look, this is a game plan. This is preliminary steps to making an event plan. So what you do here is evaluate your resources and your risk. So you want to take a look at your event. Somebody give me some concept for an event, anything. Anything fun that maybe you have heard about before. Wine and food festival. A wine and food festival, great, let's start there. All right, so what might be the risks with having a wine and food festival? Drunk people. Drunk people, how do you manage inebriation? And um, how do you manage consumption? How do you manage that leaving the festival sites? How do you manage the legality of how that impacts you, your insurance, your board, and your organization as a whole? Is that some, is that a risk you're willing to take on? How about resources? What kind of resources would you need to do to put on a food and wine festival? A venue. Hmm? A venue. A venue. Anything else? Food and wine. Food and wine. Yep, you need to have access to food yeah. and wine. <laughs> Vendors, yep, you need to get some income in there. Um, other things are maybe startup funds. You know, if your organization doesn't have any capital placed in its budget, in its annual budget for this event, you either need to raise it and be able to convey your message to somebody to sponsor your event. That's where this comes into play. The game plan allows you to develop a concept. So if you take a look at this first step, evaluating your resources and risks, you want to make your concept based on where you get from that evaluation. And also think about at, you know, you guys are an organizing body for this concept, right? You guys are putting together this event. There's multiple thoughts on how that should go. What is your commitment level? So whoever's going to actually end up putting on the event needs to be supported. And so if this event comes along and it seems like a really great idea, it seems like a concept you can work with and run with, but the support is not there, you're going to spend a lot of money on an event that is then not supported, which makes it very difficult to carry off. And so really weighing those trade-offs like, is this too much of a commitment for your organization? And those are really important when planning an event as looking at, you don't need a huge staff to plan an event, but you do need a very committed staff because somebody has to show up when the pipes blow in the venue and get all the things out in the middle of the night. Those things have to be planned for. And so those are the kinds of things you want to be realistic with your organizing body and say, is this a level of commitment? Would you guys be willing to do this? And see what it is, because maybe your committee, maybe these three people, now they're not on the committee. Now it's five of you. Can you manage the same size event with five of you committed to this cause? So that's thinking about um, you know, those resources. If we're looking at our concept, our concept is kind of getting to our overall purpose. This gives us any reason for being, why we would ever host this event. So it's really, the concept's one of the main focal points in terms of if you can't explain the concept, you shouldn't do the event. So you're going through these steps to see if you should be doing the event you don't know why you're doing an event, don't do it. It's going to be hard to sell to sponsors. So if you take a look here, it's got, um, you know, we have to fulfill a need. If there's not a market for an audience to go to your event, so say you live in Utah in a dry county and you're going to put on this food and wine event. If everybody has to travel at least four miles or four hours to get to your event, chances are they're not coming. You know, everywhere in the West you have to travel a very long period of time. And, that, and I'm just using that. There are, are certain parameters where certain events don't work. There are some you don't know. First year events you'll never know 
if there's a need. So you need to take a look at a focus group, poll community members, take a look and use the resources that you have at hand to try and figure out if there's a need or if it's different enough from an event already going on. That's an ethical decision. So you don't ever take somebody's event like an event that runs for 15 years at the Food and Wine Festival and set up your event the weekend after it, have the exact same format, and do it within an hour's drive. Well, a half an hour's drive, depending. Sometimes there's some geographical things that allow you to do that because there's enough people that it's hard for them to get a certain way. But you don't do that because ethically, that is a bad decision. And you want your organization to always be put in a positive light, and you don't want to have to handle that much PR work focusing on it instead of focusing on your event if people are upset about it. It's going to create a lot more work. So looking at those time, moving it around so that this event isn't a shadow of something else going on and making it different enough. You know, it's fine. There's multiple harvest festivals. There's multiple harvest festivals because this is, a, this is an area where that component works really well with the agriculture and the feelings of people, but they're all done very differently and at different levels with different wagon rides, different, you know, all kinds of things. And that works because they don't overlap in terms of size very much. They really break out over the spectrum of what's available in Tompkins County. So you guys are all on gifts. Y'all of you are within Tompkins County, right? So that's what this is focused on more specifically when we get into some detailed information. So taking a look at your concept, does anybody have questions about development of concept? Because this is also what you're probably going to pitch your board to get approval or pitch the owner of the company or whatever. This is the concept. This also becomes your mission statement. So getting all of your great ideas into one idea. Setting goals. When you take a look at, um, specifically here in Tompkins County, if any of you are applying for grants for celebrations or grants for um, like uh, tourism initiative grants, if you've already applied for those or if you're planning to apply for those for your event, this component comes in very strongly. Um, it's very important, especially for first year events and first time events, to set goals. Set goals you can measure. Set goals you have the staff to measure. Like if you expect everybody to go through a five question questionnaire at an event that draws 30,000 people, that's irrational. It's not gonna happen, you don't have enough staff, you don't have enough time to do that. So what you wanna do is, Try and figure out a system that can retain some data for you and see where if you're meeting your goals. Like, and that would be just an attendance one. You know, like if you wanted to see how many people were at your event, build in something that counts people. When it's a ticketed event, that's much easier than when it's a open event. You have to take a look at maybe you pull your vendors for their sales and then you calculate average sales. You can take a look at, you know, there's a, there's a variety of different ways to implement that, but to see if you're meeting your goals, and you'll know some of your goals because you'll be meeting them financially, like seeing if you meet your financial goals. That's what's setting up your budget originally. But really taking a look at what, what might be a goal for a food and wine festival put on by a nonprofit organization that is focused in healthy living. What do you think might be a goal? Okay. How many people? So you might want to say you want to hit 2,000 people, um, but what do you want it to do for your organization? Visibility. All right, so you want high visibility, promotion, marketing potential. You want new people to find out who you are and what you do, right? And so how would you measure that? Anybody have an idea how you might do, implement something to measure that? Maybe a coupon? Right, so calculating that number that'll help you also tell you what people are interested in. So if you have multiple vendors and you give out tickets and then the vendors return them to you for some type of reimbursement or something like that, that helps you understand what vendors were valuable to have and which ones were not. Maybe somebody had really good signage. You know, that's changing how people move through your event and it helps you understand if you're meeting this goal. I was thinking coupons because it allows you to people to bring back 
from getting it through a certain marketing opportunity. They do that a lot of times in the newspaper. A coupon will be attached to an advertisement, and then someone will cut out the ad, and they'll bring that coupon into Green Star. Green Star will then say, okay, this is from our Ithaca Times ad. We got 600 coupons returned from that. That is useful for our marketing. So building things that you can quantify and measure is really important. And you know, if you can't come up with realistic measurements of your goals or what your goals are, again, it's not an event you should be putting on. If there's not a way for you to measure and see whether it works for your organization or doesn't, you know, whether there's not a way to count how many people came in, there's not a way to count how much money it generated in sales, build those things in because when you can't count, you can't come back to your board the next year and say, I want to do this again. Or you also can't explain, people want facts and figures and they want a budget. And they want to look at a budget and they want to say, okay, it's going to produce X amount of dollars, X amount of imprints for marketing, X amount of clients walking in our door to request our services. This, this is how it's going to work for us. And you're not going to know the first year, but you need to be able to accurately estimate. You can also ask other people in the community that work either in a similar avenue or in something completely different, but it, uses, it utilizes a system like that. So make friends with everybody in this room. All of the great ideas I've got, I've always gotten like in the odd conversations, making, you know, oh, we should have an exploding flower flow in the Ithaca Festival Parade. This is how I would do it. And then you would, and you're like, oh, well, it probably shouldn't explode. And then you go on from there. It's really fun. Like, well, and I was like, explosion's like confetti cannon. And they're like, no, explosion means like pyrotechnics. Like, they won't let us do that. Now, you know, and so, you know, you, event planners are fun. They're creative. They get really interested in detailed concepts. But taking a look at your overall of your event just starting out and making sure that it's realistic and that it works is really, really important for moving on and being able to follow through with the details. Don't waste your time if you can't get through these first three steps because then you need to move on and come up with a new event at that point. All right, so the audience. We talked a little bit about this. I'm going to help. I should switch, switch through. I didn't switch. Sorry, guys. All right. The audience. Okay, so I'm having a hard time seeing from here to there to the light. There we go. Um, if you're looking at in Ithaca, who's your audience? If you guys could guess off the bat, say you're doing an event in the springtime, who's your audience? The community. Who else? What What is half of Ithaca's population? All right. Who is the other half? Janice residents, permanent residents. All right, so if you're doing it in the spring, what are some considerations for your event that you want to take in? You know, if you're looking at an audience, what happens for college students in the spring? Graduation. Graduation. Finals. Finals. Spring break. Sometimes holidays like St. Patrick's Day. You want to plan a street festival on St. Patrick's Day that has nothing to do with St. Patrick's, you're going to have a lot of drunk college students running through the middle of it. So you better be prepared for that. So looking at the time of the, se the season when you implement your event. If you do it, if you do your event after May, there's no students here. That you lose half the population of residents. So you better change how you're marketing your event. You know, so really understanding your audience, understanding how they move, understanding their spending ability. You know, students, they're not going to spend more than $15 at an event, especially if they know that's what the cost is walking in the door. They have different needs than going to an event. So you want to have an idea of what those are and be able to see if there's enough of an audience here if you're planning your event during spring break to attend your event. Now there are different ways you can get help with that. And there's different um, incentivizing programs that come from the Tompkins Visitor Center that I was talking about with those grant programs that want you to incentivize people to come here in the off season when we aren't already busy. And that's a huge portion of being able to secure funds is really making it apply to your grant board. And so when you're applying for tourism grants, 
making your event be in the off season. It makes it harder often, but it really does make sense. So that gets us right down to step six, which are well, we have understanding lead time. Sorry, we talked a little bit about this, but um, our lead time in general. What is, does anybody understand what lead time means? Like, when are you guys planning to do your events that are coming up? Next year. Three months. May third. I hope so. One in May. Okay, great. All right. All right. So we have to plan three months ahead for marketing. Three months ahead for marketing. So that's what. Yeah. And so those are the considerations. You want to look at your lead time. If you're planning on doing a large festival, you're going to need it at least a year. Um, not because it takes that long to do permitting, but often it takes that long to figure out what you need. Like, especially if it's a first time event, three months is a good amount of time to be able to implement pieces. You know, that's a good amount of time to look at it. You can do an event in two weeks. You can definitely do an event in two weeks. You can do it in three days. But the level and the size and the scope and what's involved really changes depending on your lead time. So um, when is your when are, is your next event coming up? We were thinking we're brainstorming for 2016. 2016? And I do have an event in possibly on Earth Day. I should real close day, but come on. And have you already started? So when you when has anybody planned an event and they didn't have enough time? Yeah. Alright, what were the issues you encountered? Um well, just not me personally, but a lot of times uh, throwing stuff together at the last minute and not being able to market it properly, and that's why we have the new rules in place. So marketing is a huge issue, but staffing, I mean, having people to be able to carry off these events and to have them be knowledgeable and be able to convey the type of service you want your organization to display, you know, if we're at Museum of the Earth, and I want to ask about um, where the, um, this certain fossil is. And this person says, I don't think we have bones here. It's going to be difficult for that person to know where they are and what you do and how to interact with you on a regular basis. So those preliminary training pieces, do you have time to raise funds? You know, you can really put an event on, but if you end up $5,000 in the hole, do you think your board's going to grant you an opportunity to put on another event? Probably not. So you want to carry it off as best as possible your first round and to have enough lead time. So, this is a fun one. Date development. Alright, has anybody ever done an outdoor event or conceptualized an outdoor event? What are, what are some of your challenges? Weather. Okay. Conflicting events. There's always millions of events going on in Ithaca, large and small. Some are promoted so you know they're going on. Some are just happening. Some wander into new areas and locations. Mid-event. Lots of things happen. Parades can take the wrong route. That has happened. And it is funny. <laughs> no, we're having a parade on our lawn. Go figure. So when you're taking a look at this, research calendars. So if any, have any of you been on the Tompkins Festivals website? Tompkins Festivals program, go to TompkinsFestivals.com. That website has an event calendar that puts in as many events as we know about, as well as school break dates, school begin dates, all of those pieces are in that calendar. And we try to do it, you know, as early in the year as we can for the following year and anything from 2016 that we know about yet. And so you want to check those dates, and then you also want to check some academic calendars, maybe IthacaEvents.com. Um, those are mostly cultural events, so if your event is more looking in uh, a musical or artistic arena, you want to check those out. Um, and those events, they, I mean, they book out really far in advance. You also want to look at major venues. So you want to look at what's going on at the Haunt, at the Dock, at the new Green Star space. You want to see if those shows are Big, big billing shows, you know, the State Theater, if they're having a really large show that looks like it's a similar audience to the one that would want to come to your event, have it right before it. Have it right after it. If somebody has a whole slew of things to do on their day, they're going to do it. 
But if they have them conflicting, they're going to choose one. So if you are, so working with, you can piggyback off other events if you think it's a similar audience, but make sure there's enough time in between to get to the first event, to the second event, or else what you're going to end up, you're going to have a really full beginning and nobody there at the end, which stresses out your staff, your vendors, doesn't allow people to generate income as fast as they would like if you could stretch it over the full time period. So um, looking at date development, first you want to consult calendars. You also want to look at your time of the year. As we talked about, outdoor events have lots of challenges, like when it pours in Stewart Park in the middle of Ithaca Festival. Has anybody ever been there for that? Yeah. All right, so what, did, what does everybody do? Well, a lot of people leave, but a lot, a lot of, people of people just don't recover. All right, well, some of this, part of the problem with having an event of that size in Stewart Park is there's not enough cover for all the people who attend. So people either have to leave, which it's not easy to get out of there all at once, so it makes congestion, it creates security issues for you, then you end up with a problem at the city and then at your permit meeting for the following year. So working out those strategies are, is it possible, is it risky, is there an amount of problem solving? Like, is there a way for you to build a bigger tent and not fill it so much with tables so there's more space for people to hang out in if it's a passing rain shower? You know, there was a, like a tornado that hit the end of Stewart Park in the middle of Ithaca Festival in 2008. Um, that was really detrimental and they realized that the city evacuation plan didn't work. So that was really important for the Ithaca Festival making their decisions going down the road of, well, how many days can we really handle being in Stewart Park? We know people love it, but is it too risky for us? And as you've seen, there's been, they tried it for a few more years, but there's nothing that breaks the weather from coming in to a festival that's set up very temporarily. So those are, you know, when you're looking at a long-term event, every year you have to reevaluate those things, especially based on the year before. So those are some pieces. Also, shoulder season, you're going to see this term. So if you guys take a look below there, why would the Tompkins Tourism um, Program want you to set up your event in, in shoulder season? Who can tell me? Bring more people in. Mm -hmm. we, have high, we, have, we have about the same number. When students leave, we have about the same number of tourists coming in the summertime. But in the wintertime, when students are very focused, on the hill. We can pull them down for some events, but some events are just not student events. And so looking at who is who could be our tourist traffic to come in in those off seasons. Oh, I think, I think that I have a better breakfast. Um, I know that a lot of parents will come in if there's, like, they'll come to visit, because they come in visit children often. Mm -hmm. and, and they'll want to come in when there's um, also an event because they, their kids don't obviously want to be with them 27. Right. So they'll try and overlap it with a uh, weekend when there may be something else that's, that uh, has a pull for them. Right. And so. that is a huge, that's the exact concept for how the Finger Lakes Wine Trail works. Right. Uh, especially on Seneca Lake. So between Seneca and Cuba Lake, they plan their major like wine and chocolate events around and um, the Herb Festival around parent bring back dates. When parents